All right. Well, hey, I'm glad, glad you're here this morning with us. Uh, we're going to continue. Uh, we're in week three of a series that we are calling Activate, um, Awakening Faith. And really what we're hoping happens over the next four weeks is that every single person here would have a better grasp and understanding on what biblical faith is and why it's important to our lives as believers, um, that you would commit to living a life of faith, that your faith would actually increase and grow over the next uh, four to five weeks. Um, And last, that, that our church here, we would be a church that is walking by faith and living by faith. And so um, we talked uh, last week about Noah and how Noah, in the midst of a pretty incredible set of circumstances, a culture that was completely against him, Noah lived in faith to not allow the culture to compromise him. Noah was able over the course of his life, he did not get compromised by the culture around him. And this morning, we're going to look at one of the icons of the faith. Now, when I was growing up, uh, my dad uh, in Northeast Ohio, my dad had this powder blue van. And it was one of those cool vans that it had the seats in the back, but he had a big bed that he could slip in. It was like a big piece of plywood that had the carpet over it. He would, he would, this was before seatbelt laws. He'd put it in there. And we'd, I had uh, two, uh, my brother and two stepbrothers. And so, man, we'd be back there playing full football in the back of the van. We'd be wrestling. And, man, that was back before seatbelt laws. So, you know, you could do anything in the back of that van. And, uh, so, but my dad, my dad, we, he loved to travel. He played uh, softball in the summer, and so he would play all over the place. So we, we would go to Pennsylvania, and we would go to Indiana. We'd go all these places. Our, all of us would get in the van, and we would, would, would take off. And uh, one of the things that my dad loved to do when we were on trips that were taking a little bit longer than, than the normal trip is he loved to give us trivia questions. And he would give us a dime for every right answer we got. And by the time we got to where we were going, sometimes we might have like 250, three bucks. Like that was snow cones, that was popcorn, that was hot dogs, that was a lot, a lot of incredible things for us. And so my dad, he loved so he would, would, would ask questions about all kinds of things. And he would, he would say, okay. And I remember that there were icons in all the different industries. So he would talk about Francis Ford Coppola and the movie industry. And he would talk about J.D. Rockefeller and the business. And then... He loved baseball, and he would ask all kinds of baseball questions. And he would talk, and and there were icons like Babe Ruth that were like, oh, my gosh, you know, Babe Ruth was this larger-than-life figure. We're going to look today at a man in the Bible who is one of those icons, and his name is Abraham. And we're going to look here at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We're just moving right along through, through, through Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at verse 8 through 10. And we're going to see what we can learn from Abraham's life. Starting in verse 8. It says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he was looking forward city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So Abraham is mentioned in this, this hall of faith. And he's mentioned early in the hall of faith. And he's mentioned as, as someone who, who God called to, to live a life of faith. And you see it, and we're going to come back to it here in a minute. You see in this particular passage of Scripture that it says in a fascinating way that, that Abraham didn't know where he was going. But by faith, he trusted God and he, and he stepped out. Now, we need to go back a little bit into Genesis to see kind of what was, what was the surrounding backdrop with Abraham. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me uh, to Genesis chapter 11. So Hebrews 11 is picking up what is going on in Genesis chapter 11 into chapter 12. It's interesting that at the end of Genesis chapter 11, the Bible mentions Abraham's father. And I'm just going to read some of it to you. It, said, it says, uh, starting in verse 24, when Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. And after Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram. That's, that's Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And this is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. And while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married, and the name of Abraham's wife was Sarah, Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was barren and had no children. Now it gets interesting. So Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram. Now listen. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. So Terah, he's got, he's got this son, Abraham, Abram, who's married to Sarah. He has this, this, uh, this, this, this family. And, and they actually set out to leave from Ur to, to go to Canaan. Now, Canaan is significant because Canaan is the promised land. So God, God calls Terah to, to leave Ur to go to, to Canaan. Let me read it again. Together they, they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But listen. But when they came to Haran... They settled there. They settled there. And Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Now listen, what's significant about this is that God, God had, had called Terah to, on this faith journey to, to go to Canaan, to go to this promised land. And it's it's a picture for us at times, if we're not careful, God, God can have a call on our lives. And God does have a call on our lives. But it's really, really easy to get to a certain place 
in our Christianity or a certain place in our faith or a certain place in our life where we just settle. We settle. That's what her, God never called Terah to settle in Haran. He called him to Canaan. But he got there, and I'm sure, come on. I, how many of us have ever done that? I've done that, right? Hey, you know, I'm going to drive. Uh, we, when me and I were driving all the way down here from, from Indiana, when we were moving down here a few years ago, and we got about two hours north of Austin, and I was like, I'm tired. I'm just going to settle here. For the night. Now, thank goodness I didn't just live there. That I that I came on the remainder of the two hours, Austin. But it's easy in life to just get to a place where we said, "Now listen, Haran Tara lived two hundred and five years, and he died in Haran." Now listen. Now we pick it up in Genesis chapter twelve, and God is going to come to the next generation. And he's going to come and say, okay, Abram, now I'm calling you to get up and to leave what's comfortable and to leave what's familial and familiar. And I'm going to call you to, to, to go on this journey of faith. Now watch verse 1 of chapter 12. So Last verse of Hebrews 11, Terah lived 205 years. He died in Haran. Chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram, quote, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4. So Abraham left. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. And he took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. God comes to Terah, and he says, Terah, man, go to Canaan. Go to the promised land. He's on his way, and he stops, and he settles and he lives out the rest of his days. And then God comes to Abraham, to Abram, and he says, all right, Abram, now you arise and go to the land. Now listen, circle back with me. And we're just going to look at a couple key things that we can pull out of this passage. Circle back with me now to Hebrews 11, and we're going to look at the same verses of Scripture that we looked at before. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his, as it, as it, as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Now listen, the first thing that I want all of us to notice in this passage of Scripture is this, that God initiates we respond. God initiates. Come on. God is the one who comes to Abraham and he says to him, Abraham, listen, get up, leave, go. It wasn't Abraham kind of in his own ingenuity and his own, um, you know, hyper faith, so to speak, like, Hey, man, I'm going to go try something great. You know, no, no, no. God is the one. Listen, God is always the initiator in our lives. I love this quote from Henry Blackaby. Look at this. 
anything of spiritual significance that happens in our lives or your life will be a result of God's activity in you. He is infinitely more concerned with your life and your relationship with him than you or I could possibly be. Anything of spiritual significance is initiated by God. He initiates. So let me ask you this. What what is God initiating in your life? What, What are those things? Now listen. There's a key to this whole process. So so God is the initiator. We respond. But listen, how, how many times does God initiate in our life? Well, look with me at Genesis 15 real quick. So how did God initiate with Abraham? Genesis 15, 1, three chapters later, look at what it says. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. In a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. So God initiates, we respond. How, how does God initiate many times? Well, in Abram's life, in Abraham's life, it was through a vision. Now, what's, the, what's a really nice way of saying this? A really nice way of saying this is just this. All of us, like Abraham, have to explore God's divine inspirations. Come on. We've been talking about this, that God speaks to us. Come on, Genesis 12, 1. What did it say? The Lord said to Abram, leave. Genesis 15, 1. The Lord, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Listen, God is always, he's always speaking to us. Many times, we, we, we think that God's divine inspirations is just us. We think, oh, I just have this thought. Listen, God uses our imagination. God, like all, have you ever had that where all of a sudden, Like 20 years ago, I'm mowing my grass in Houston. I don't know why I was mowing it because it was like, it was July. It was like 105 degrees and my grass was dead. I I really honestly, there might've been like two weeds or something and I mowed the whole grass. So I'm out there mowing my grass in Houston. I'm sweating to death, right? Like the sweat is going down to my eyes and my eyes are like, you know, itching. And I'm mowing my grass And I'm on the left side of the house going down back towards the fence. And all of a sudden, God starts showing me nations. And he starts showing me faces. And I stop. And I'm sitting out there, and it's 105 degrees in Houston. And I'm out there, and and I'm stopped. and, and, And... in a vision, okay? It's, and so I'm sitting there. It's not like I'm seeing something that's like tangible, but I'm seeing something in my mind's eye. It's like there's something, and I'm sitting there, and I'm seeing all these young people and faces and places and all this stuff, and, and, and I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you trying to show me? And he's like, Dave, I've called you to full-time ministry, and I'm gonna send you to nations, Nations. You know how many nations I've got the privilege of going to? 60. God, he, he, but many times we'll, 
hear something in our spirit or we'll see something or, or God will begin to show us something and we just kind of go, oh, that's just us or, you know, that, no, 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 no. Like, explore God's divine inspirations. Abraham left a place off of, off of one word and off of a vision. Come on. So God is the initiator. We respond. How does God initiate? Man, he's, he, through other people, you hear something, you see through. In our spirit, God is like, he's always doing that. He's always speaking. Third thing, Abraham didn't have all the answers or know how everything would end up. Neither will we. Neither will we. Look it. Look at what it says. When called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He didn't know how it was all going to end up. He didn't have the... You know, he, he didn't have the, the, the ability to go to the end of the book and read the last chapter. He didn't know how it was going to end up. We won't either, but listen, he stepped out anyway. He started. There's never a perfect time to start. There's never a perfect time to go. Never. There wasn't for Abraham. There's not for us. Fourth, Abraham was looking for something. He was ultimately looking for what God was doing. Look at what it says. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city, one translation says, with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Another says he was looking forward to the city whose architect was God. So what does that mean? For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He's essentially going, God, I want to be about what you're doing. I'm God. I'm looking for how you're moving in the earth. I'm looking for how you're moving in our city. I'm looking for how you're moving. God, what are you doing? What are you building? Because God, I want to be a part of that. Now listen, I love this. We ask ourselves, God, so, so what are you doing in the world? God, what are you doing in our city? God, what are you doing with me? What are you doing with me? Frederick Beekner, he has one of, this might be, my absolute favorite quote of any quote that I've ever heard in my entire life. And I read it about 10 years ago when I was doing a study on missions. And I saw this quote and I went, wow. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Translation, many times, the place where God calls you is where your deep passions, where your deep passions and the world's deep need collide. Now listen to this. This week I did a bunch of study. I just want to, I just want to give you some of this. Because 
Abraham didn't know where he was going. He stepped out in faith. When he stepped out in faith, God said, listen, you have no idea, Abraham, what your faith is going to produce. Abraham, what your faith is going to produce is going to be a nation, and it's going to be called Israel, and out of Israel is going to come the Messiah, and out of the Messiah is going to come the redemption for the entire world. Abraham, you simply stepping out in faith, you are going to bless the entire world. Wow. But listen to this. He steps out. Listen, God is calling every single one of us here in some way, shape, or form to steps of faith. There's never a good time. We don't ever know how it's going to end up. We could look bad. Listen, seven years ago, a, a girl comes to me at our church and she says, I have a passion for the 163 million orphans in the world today. Her name was Danielle Ott. And she said, I have a passion for it. I want to do something about it. I've already adopted multiple kids, but I want to do something. God's given me a skill set. He's like, I want to do something. And so I said, okay, let's meet. In the next two weeks, four people independently of her came to me and said, we have a passion for orphan care. And I'm like, okay, God. <laughs> I could, like, five people in a two-week period coming to meet me as the missions pastor, right? So I sat down with all of them, and I said, I said okay, where do you want to start? She says, I want to start. I want to do a, a conference because I want to cast vision for this. I want to do, and there's a lady that I heard at an orphan summit named Beth Guckenberger who wrote a book called Reckless Faith. And she says, I want her to come in and speak. I says, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. We planned it. We had 350 people at our first orphan summit at Traders Point Christian Church. And Beth Guckenberger got up and spoke, and she said, listen, I was graduating from Indiana University. I had my life planned out, and I went on a short-term mission trip to Albania and as I, with Campus Crusade. And as I walked through the city, I saw a four-year-old laying there without parents, without anything. And I went to go grab him, and the police came in and said, you can't touch him. And, and, and the interpreter comes over and says, hey, what's going on here? And, and she says, I, I, I want to care for this child. And he says, no, 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 no. This child belongs to the gypsy village. They keep him up all night so that they can put him on the streets, and he can sleep all day, so people come by and throw money at him. And then they collect all the money. And she said, I went back from that trip on the plane home, and I was ruined. I was ruined. And she said, I can't go back to my corporate job, so to speak, and just go. Th she started a ministry called Back to Back Ministries, ministering to orphans globally. They're now on four continents, and they serve 20,000 orphans. Come on. And she'll tell you, I looked at clips this week. There was a, I was going to show one. She said, she said, she said, I didn't know how it was going to end. When I showed up in Monterey, Mexico the first time, I had a heart. I didn't have all the answers. But that's where God works best. That's where he works best. She wrote a book called Reckless Faith. Listen, your step of faith might just be fully surrendering to Christ. This week, I watched the testimony of a guy named Phil Robertson, and he's the, the patriarch of the Duck Dynasty thing, and he was sharing his testimony, and he said, listen, when I, when I went to college, I started doing drugs and drinking and, and being involved in immorality and all this stuff, and he says, my life was, was a wreck, and I came home, and I told my wife, you need to take the three kids and leave, and, and she, she thought the marriage was over. He had gotten in a big fight. The law was after him. He's like, I'm going to go hang out for a few weeks in the woods, and nobody's going to be able to find me. 
And when they came home, they found a note. And he said, meet, meet me at the church. I'm getting baptized. You can find his testimony. The kids came and they said, they sell. And Willie Roberts will, will say, the turning point in our family's life was when my dad fully decided to follow Christ. So maybe you're here this morning and we talk about this faith stuff like, oh, this is so huge and I couldn't da 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 da. No, sometimes it's just the little thing. Listen, maybe you're, you're waiting for a mate and you're going, all right, God, you're calling me to walk in faith. Listen, you might be like my friend John who waited when he was 40 years old, God brought him his wife, Moretta. They have five kids now. In faith, he waited. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what? What God's stirring in me, what God's initiating is, God wants, to, I believe he wants to do something in my family. He wants to reach my family. Guess what? It's the same thing, man. It's just taking steps of faith. Now, listen, last couple things. I was on an article this week. And the title of it was How Five Small Town Girls Saved Lives. A young girl, she was 12 years old, Madeline McLean. She heard about how malaria kills one child every 30 seconds. And she says, I'm sitting in my living room, and we decide, can we do something about this? They start a thing called Network Against Malaria. She was in sixth grade. From that time on, they now have 30,000 volunteers, 21 global chapters. They've sent out 11,500 malaria nets, and they've saved 34,500 lives. God initiates. We respond. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how it's going to end up. But we step. And you step, and you step, and all of a sudden you get out there like Abraham, and all of a sudden you realize, wow, God, this is bigger than I could have imagined. Second article, guy by the name of Alec Erbaugh, from artistic rebel to global change maker. He heard, he was at a fundraising event, he heard some people from Ghana talking about how one billion people in the world are illiterate, 232 million children. He, he said, what can I do? I'm just an artist, I'm just a musician. Da, da, da. He starts a program that now has educated literally hundreds of thousands of kids in Ghana. Katie Davis, 16 years old. God speaks to her and, and says, I'm going to send you to Uganda. Watch this video. It's a four-minute video, her sharing her story. I want to ask you to come with me on a journey. A journey that started three years ago when I thought I knew what my life would look like. And I had no idea. A journey that has shown me more about the Father's heart and his extravagant compassion than I could have ever imagined. A journey that requires me to give more of myself every single day. It's a journey that took me from a 10 month commitment to teach kindergarten in Uganda to a lifetime commitment of bettering and serving this country. 
I'm Katie Davis. I'm 21 years old, and I live here in Uganda. I run Amadima Ministries, and my full-time occupation is that I'm a mom to a 14 little girl. From an early age, people would always ask me, you know, you have like career day, what do you want to be when you grow up type thing, and I'd always said I wanted to be Mother Teresa, just because I, I guess I just loved her heart for children. It is my 16th birthday, and I'm eating sushi at my favorite restaurant when I tell my parents that I'd like to explore the possibility of doing mission work out of high school. I graduate high school having made a commitment to teach at a preschool for a year in the middle of nowhere, Uganda. My parents were so not on board, but, you know, it came to a point where it was like, okay, God said, you choose me, or you choose to please your dad. And uh, what is, what's it going to be? And I said, all right, I'm going back. It is January, and I'm looking at a little girl crushed under a brick wall with no one to take care of her and her siblings. I offer to take them home with me until we find a better solution. I'm not really sure what to do with them, but I know that they are God's children. They stay. It is three days later, and the littlest one looks up, and she calls me mommy. My heart breaks in two. I have no idea what to do. But something clicks. I'm even more scared than the day that I stepped on that plane, but I know that this is right. Today I have 14. I get a lot of that, like, do you really feel that they're your children? Do you really feel like it's a family? And I say, can you come on over for dinner and tell me? Because um, it is. It is a family. People say to me all the time, like, wow, you are so lucky that you found what God wants you to do with your life. And I kind of look at those people and think, like, well, I didn't, I didn't find it. It was just it was just in the Bible. And so as someone who calls themselves a Christian, I mean, it's very apparent that you are to love the Lord with all your heart, and then you're to love your neighbor as yourself. I'm like, myself doesn't want to be starving, and so I don't want other people in the world to be starving. Jesus does not ask that we care for the less fortunate. He demands it. When calling ourselves Christ followers, caring for orphans and the desolate and the widow are not an option. It's a requirement. I would like to invite you to come with me on this journey that is so far from over and see what God will do next. Yeah, that's somebody who found her deep passion with the world's deep need and her calling. Now listen, not every one of us are called to go do that. But every single one of us, I'm telling you, God is initiating things in your life. And again, it might just be, hey, I'm stepping here. For others, it it might be, you know what it is, my family. For others, it might be, God, really, there are some things that you're beginning to show me and stir in me and of how, God, you want to show yourself through me. Last thing is this. Don't underestimate what God can do through you and your small steps. Don't underestimate what God can do. Abraham, listen, and we'll end. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance. Later. The process of God is always this. Promise, process, patience, realization. It's always that. He promised Abraham some things that Abraham didn't see, come on, for almost 40 years. He said, Abraham, listen, you're going to bless the whole world, your faith. Like, look at the stars on, in the sky. You see them? Count them? So shall your descendants be. Look at the sand on the seashore. Can you count them? No. So shall your descendants be. And 39 years later, he doesn't have a descendant. Promise, process, 
patience, realization. Oh, it happened. Listen, don't underestimate. He obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. God, I don't know what this is going to look like, but I know you're calling me. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Process. Patience. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Listen, God is calling us to live a life of faith. He's calling each and every one of us. It's different for each of us, but he's still calling us to it. Listen, in a nutshell, Abraham's faith was activated. Activated. That's what I'm praying for, for all of Listen, I can tell you as your pastor, don't underestimate what you can do. Don't underestimate the gifts and the callings and the passions and the spheres and the platforms and the ingenuity and the giftings that are in you. Come on. Pursue divine inspirations because they change the world. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the privilege it is to pastor this church, these people. I love them. I love that I get to walk with them and serve them. God, thank you for the the giftings that are in every single person here. God, I just pray that over this next week that, uh, God, you would make uh, just clear and known those, those divine inspirations that you're stirring. Some of them... I love them bigger, but God, Lord, let us, Lord, have the faith, Lord, to to pursue them and to step out because in it, you will get the glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.